Alright, continuing with this series of videos, um, examining the uh, axioms, the theory behind um, the conventional notions of what's happening in our physical world, um, especially now related to electro mechanical and magnetical things, <laughs> I guess, you know. Um, so this is sort of an interesting subject because we get into the <clears throat> the subject of these eddy currents and um, so, you know, let's let them start it and then we'll uh, might do some drawing here illustrating the phenomenon. Now, I want to go one step further and and I want to power the LR circuit with a AC power supply. If you have an AC power supply, so it's changing all the time, the voltage, now of course the self-inductance, is fighting back all the time. Not just only in the beginning, as you saw in this circuit, but now, of course, it is active almost all the time. So we can do away with this. And so now we replace the battery by a AC power supply, which we normally put just a wiggle there. And here is the self-inductance, L. The coil, <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know. Um, yeah, so now the trick is, is that as the polarity keeps switching, the magnetic field keeps switching, which means it's consuming itself constantly. So it's not going to be as much of a battery. And here is the resistor, R. And let the voltage provided by this power supply be V0 times the cosine of omega t, omega being the angular frequency. I don't know why we don't make the voltage some kind of standard number. I mean, why, why make it a cosine of something? It just makes it horribly complicated. But anyway, fine. And now I have to apply Faraday's law not Kirchhoff's rule, Faraday's law, when I go around this circuit and I set up the differential equation. And of course the differential equation is going to be exactly like this, except that V now is V0 times the cosine of omega t. And now I have to solve for this differential equation. That's the only difference. I don't have to start from ground zero. And the solution to this differential equation is quite remarkable and not so intuitive. The current as a function of time now is V0 divided by the square root of R squared plus omega L squared times the cosine of omega T minus phi and the tangent of phi, that angle phi, is omega L divided by R. And of course we need... All right, the angle phi. So yeah, I don't know what, I don't know what angle that is. So whatever, fine. It's some time to digest this. Yes. The first thing that you notice is that there is a phase lag between the current and the driving voltage. If phi, as you're going to see, is um, 90 degrees, then the current is delayed by one quarter of a cycle. Well, the fact that the current comes later than the driving voltage perhaps is intuitive because the self-inductance is fighting the change in the current. So it's perhaps not so surprising that there's going to be a delay. The current comes a little later. If you look at this equation here, then what you have in front of the cosine term is obviously the maximum possible current, because the cosine term is just oscillating between plus one and minus one, and so this here is the maximum current that you can ever get. In one full cycle, you get positive and you get negative that value. And notice here the role of omega L really plays the role of a resistance, and in fact, the dimension of omega L is, ome is, is, is ohms. It really plays the role of a resistance, and if omega is very high, then the resistance here becomes very high, and so your current becomes very low. Well, that's intuitively pleasing, because if omega is high, then the changes, the DIDTs, are very, very high. All right, so the more changes, the more incapable of internal reflections. Well, in a sense, I suppose there's a point where the, the rhythm of the changes will match, you know, have a resonance frequencies where you still get reflections because of the time it takes you're changing you're changing the polarization in front of something you're switching it from 
<laughs> yeah, you're switching it from this to this. And one is a reflection and one is not. And the point is, is if that change is happening at a rate that is equal to the distance at the time it takes to get across the two surfaces, then even though it's switching, it can always be face up uh, at the right distance. And so then you'll get the internal reflections and you'll create um, the magnetism, the extra, the extra uh, current, um, the extra effect. But if they're out of phase, then the thing will get self-destructive and there won't be any um, strong magnetic field which will cut back on the inductance in terms of it will cut back on that thing causing the effect in the wires ahead and um, so the current will flow easier if there's more chaos. And therefore if there are very fast changes the induced EMF is going to be high and so the current will be low. Also if L is very high then the system also is capable of fighting back very hard. And so it puts up a large resistance. So it's also pleasing that you see the L there downstairs. If omega is very low, in your mind you can make omega zero. You don't even have alternating current when omega is zero. Then you have DC, which is direct current. So when you make omega zero, you simply get I is V zero divided by Ohm. That's Ohm's law. That's obvious that you get that. Let's now look at the phase angle. The tangent of phi is omega L divided by R. If the self interrupt is very large, then the system has a strong ability to fight back. So it can delay that current by a large amount. And the same is true if omega is high. If omega is high, then the time changes are very, changes occur on a very small time scale. And so the system can fight back. But remember, you always have the EMF proportional to the IDT. And so it's also pleasing to see that omega and L are upstairs here. So either one of being large, it can fight back and it can hold back the, the current. I have worked out a situation whereby we have an LR circuit. This is on the web, you can download that, so you don't have to copy it. And the reason why I have these values is because it's directly coupled to a demonstration that I will do shortly. You see an L in series with an R, the L is 10 millihenry, and the R is 10 ohms, and let V0 be 10 volts. And here you see three frequencies, 100 hertz, 1000, and 10,000 hertz. And here you see the values for omega. You have to multiply hertz with 2 pi. And look now at omega L. At low frequency, 100 hertz, omega L is 6.3 ohms. Compare that with the 10 ohms, it's maybe comparable. But now look, for instance, at 10,000 hertz, the omega L is huge, 630 ohms. So it entirely determines, so to speak, the resistance of that circuit. And so the current that is going to run, at least this is the maximum current, this value, which we also saw here on the blackboard, that current at high frequency is enormously reduced. It's 50 times lower than this current at low frequency, even though they have the same value for V0. And then you see here the phase angles. So um, the resistance goes up as the frequency goes up, and that knocks the current down. Okay. Got it. And the reason why I have these values is that I can make you listen to this. I can make you hear this, because your hearing is very good at 100 hertz, and since all of you are young, you can probably hear even 10,000 hertz. Maybe some of you can even hear 20 kilohertz. When you get older, you lose your high frequencies. In fact, my frequency cutoff is somewhere near 4,000 hertz. I'm going to make you listen to music, and there will be violins, which produce probably three, four, five thousand 5,000 hertz. And then I will turn on all of a sudden the 10 millihenry. So first I will make you listen to music whereby there is no 10 millihenry in there. And then I will turn on the 10 millihenry and what you will hear that the violins disappear because the current reduction is now huge on the high frequency but is very little on the low frequency. And that's the idea of what a self inductor can do for you. Right. So um, the idea would be is that certain frequencies can pass and certain other frequencies can't. And, you know, they really don't have a theory as to the exact cause here, so there's nothing to argue in that sense. But, yeah, I mean, obviously, <laughs> um, uh, it's frequency dependent in the sense that, um, you know, that changes the, the phases. The different frequencies will be at different phases besides being at different frequencies. So if you listen to this, Just 
There's no salvaging Doctor Who now. No music either. No music either. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a different music. No salvaging Doctor. Salvaging Doctor. The high frequencies are gone. And the low frequencies aren't feeling that good either, so, so it hasn't it hasn't done the low frequencies much good either. But anyway, okay, continuing. No self doctor. You can turn the violin concerto into a cello concerto. Just cut the violins out. Okay. I cannot make you listen to the phase shift. Not even in the case of the 90 degree phase shift, and that is quite obvious. Because what does it mean that there is a 90 degree phase shift? It means that during one cycle of 10,000 hertz, which takes only one ten thousandth of a second, that the high frequencies are shifted by only 25 microseconds. There's no way that your ears, your ears can hear that. The fact that the composer wanted those violins to come in 25 microseconds earlier than, than they do, of course, is something you cannot hear. So I cannot make you listen to the phase shift. But for the phase shift, I have something else. And for that something else, I'm going to return to the to my last lecture, in which we levitated a woman, magnetic levitation. And so I'm going to return to that idea and grind a little deeper than we did when I gave that lecture, just before spring break. I had a coil, and I was driving that coil, coil with 60 hertz AC. And let's assume that, looking from above, that the current was running in clockwise direction, which is exactly what I assumed when I discussed this with you. And so the magnetic field is coming down like this, magnetic dipole field, produced by this coil. And then we had here, we had a conducting plate under there. So I guess I don't you know, see the logic of, you're pointing out it's AC current, so obviously the current doesn't have one direction. It obviously keeps switching in the the B field keeps switching <laughs> in direction, so I don't know why he drew it that way. And I said to you, when this magnetic field is increasing in strength, then there's going to be an induced EMF here, which tries to oppose that change. And so the induced current that is going to run, which we call eddy current, is going to run in this direction. If this is clockwise, this current is going to be counterclockwise, so it's going to Magnetic. All right, so this is all inferred. I mean, I don't think they have any direct evidence that any eddy current is created. The only thing created is a reciprocal of the field. So the energy comes down, creates a mirror image, so, okay, of itself, and is now reflecting the force back between the two mirrors, essentially. And so that's how it should be looked at, but I don't think it's, a, it's not in any way a, a real current field in this direction. It opposes the change of the increasing magnetic field, Lenz law. And since the two currents are in opposite direction, the two repel each other. Well, they're not in opposite direction. Um, I mean, they're at any one moment, they keep switching. So when it switches, the other one switches. The mirror image is the mirror image, and mirror images reflect. So, yeah, that's the difference between paramagnetic and ferromagnetic. And you bought off on that. And we levitated a woman. However, no one asked me the question, what happens a little later in time when the magnetic field is still in the downwards direction, but it is decreasing? Since it is an AC current, there comes a time that the magnetic field will be decreasing in time. Now the EMF here must flip over because Lenz says, sorry, we don't like the decrease. The moment that the EMF flips over, this current will flip over. The two currents are now in the same direction and they will attract each other. And <clears throat> yeah, but there's no, like I said, no reason to believe that happens. <laughs> so as a practical matter. So there goes your magnetic levitation. Half the time attraction, half the time they repel each other. But yet, we did levitate the woman. Like I said, when it's declining, it's just declining. It doesn't mean it's switching over. So there's no switching over until it actually switches over. So until you, till you, till you, you know, turning is not flipping. So turning's okay, it's, you know, because you're still not doing this. They're still doing this. So I don't see any theory behind that. And the secret lies in the self inductance. This current that runs here 
runs over a pass, which is very difficult for me to anticipate, which has a certain resistance R, and it has a certain self-inductance L. We know what omega is. That's about 360. And so we do get in this conductor, we get the current, the induced current here, is delayed by a phase angle, given by this equation, is delayed over the induced EMF. The EMF, immediately coupled to what this coil is doing, but the induced current is delayed. And I have something that will allow that, allow you to see that, perhaps. Uh, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> so. I'll just say that for the, that's the short answer. I don't think so. Even more detail. This red curve is the current through the coil. The coil that you see there above. And when the curl is above the black line, it's clockwise, and when it is below the black line, it's counterclockwise. The vertical scales are arbitrary. The green curve is the EMF, which is induced in the conductor. Notice when the magnetic field increases, when the current goes up in the coil, that the EMF in the conductor is in such a direction that it opposes the change of that magnetic field. But now when the magnetic field goes down, when the current in the coil goes down, immediately the EMF flips over, which is what I just mentioned to you. And therefore, if the induced current and the... In I don't think there's this much lag, but there, there could be a lag, you know. But I don't think there's this much lag, but we'll see. Due to the EMF, we're in phase with each other. Half the time, you would have attraction, and half the time, you would have that the two repel each other. And that won't give you magnetic levitation. Here, what you see is a blue curve which represents the induced current. I call that the eddy current. If there is no phase shift between the induced EMF and the induced current, notice that half the time the blue curve and the red curve are in opposite direction. When they're in opposite direction, they repel each other. When they're in the same direction, they attract each other. But now, if I have a phase delay so that the induced current comes later than the EMF, and I'm going to do something dramatic, I'm going to shift it by 90 degrees. So the current is now 90 degrees delayed relative to the induced EMF. Look now that the red curve and the blue curve are always in opposite direction. And so now there's 100% of the time a repelling force. The coil repels the conductor, and the conductor repels the... Okay, so I would argue that that's not why it happens. It's, it repels because you've pushed it with pressure. It's pressure back. It's a mirror, and it's moving at the speed of light. So I don't think any of this is... This is this is their um, effort to come up with an explanation that includes their EMF and their current, and there aren't EMFs and currents. There's just one effect: the atoms are polarized, and then they're depolarized, and they're either done by changing the force that's hitting them, or it's done by moving electricity through um, a wire or a conductor. Corporate. Now, in the case when we levitated the woman, I'm sure that the phase delay was not 90 degrees, but maybe it was only 30 or 40 degrees. But the net result is, here the shift is not 90 degrees, the net result is that you get, on average, a repelling force. And so the secret of the repelling force in the case of the levitation of this coil, and therefore of the levitation of the woman, lies in the fact that there is a finite self-inductance in here. If R is zero, then, of course, we have a superconductor, so again, I, it's, I, I don't see any reason to, they're only doing this because they've come up with a theory of what they think is a self-inductor is why it's a self-inductor and it's based on this current thing when it's really, as the current is a byproduct of the polarization. Then phi is always 90 degrees. When R is zero, this is infinitely high. So now we get a 90 degree phase shift and I did a demonstration whereby I had a little magnet floating above a superconductor. That was an ideal case. Phi was then 90 degrees, so they always repel each other. Today I want to do a more controlled demonstration whereby I can actually calculate the self-inductance and I also can calculate the resistance. And what I will do today is I will have a coil which is stationary and I will have a conductor which is not stationary. Here's my coil, AC, 60 hertz. That's the coil. And I have a ring, and the ring is made of aluminum. 
and I know exactly the dimensions of this ring. I know the radius, it's about five centimeters. I know the thickness, I know everything. It's an aluminum ring. It has a radius of about five centimeters. Since I know all the dimensions, I can calculate the resistance of that ring. You should be able to do that too if I gave you the dimensions. And so the resistance of that ring, very roughly, is about seven times 10 to the minus five ohms. It's very small. I can all, that is at room temperature, by the way. At the lower temperature, the resistance is lower. I can also calculate very roughly what the self-inductance is of that ring. Now, that's not so easy. Because here, when I calculate... <coughs> In my opinion, that's the part that's just going to be made up. There's the, <laughs> he's making up its, uh, its self-inductance. It doesn't have any. Calculated the self-inductance. The magnetic field was constant. I assumed it was constant, uniform inside. That's not the case when you have a ring. You have a dipole field. However, I just assumed that the magnetic field was the same everywhere at the surface of the ring. So again, he's saying it's a dipole field, but it really isn't. It, it, only at certain angles is it a dipole. So only on the ring is it dipole. The rest of it's just charged. And with that assumption, admittedly I could be off maybe by 20 or 30 percent, with that assumption I find that the self-inductance is 10 to the minus 7 Henry. I know what omega is, it's 360 roughly. And so I find that omega L over R for this ring is about one half, run at that frequency omega. And that gives me a phase angle phi of 25 degrees. And therefore, the ring is going to be repelled by the coil, and of course the coil is going to be repelled by the ring. I'll put the ring here, and ring is supported by this, so this ring cannot fall over. The only difference between this experiment and that one is, first of all, I can be very quantitative there. I can actually calculate the phase angle, but here that's almost impossible. Here, it is the conductor that I'm going to make levitate, and the coil is stationary. And here, it was the conductor that was stationary, and the coil is floating. But of course, the idea is exactly the same. And so, what I want to do now is make you see it there, actually. Mm. And we'll have to... Come up there. So this is the part I wanted to get to. <laughs> it took a long time to get here. Yeah, there you see this this ring. Maybe I should first show you the whole setup. So this ring goes over here. This is an aluminum ring, and I'm going to make it levitate by simply running 60 hertz, 110 volts through this coil. You probably make it pop off because it's it's going to it, when it's very low, it's going to have high pressure immediately. It's going to be established. I hope I do nothing wrong. Oh, no, I have to turn on my AC. Oh, my God, that was not... See, that was not my... Yes, it was his intention, I think. Um, so you could see it right there. It shot the, the thing right off. So obviously it, there's not any phase delays or any of this other kind of stuff. It immediately pressurized, and it immediately figured out I'm right next to a very strong magnet. And immediately there was a huge amount of pressure created, and it flung the thing off. It was compressing a magnet and letting it go, and it shot. So you, it'd be very hard to make the argument that there was some um, inductance slowly creating a field. Tension. A good thing we don't have a woman sitting on the ring now. My idea was to have it levitate. By the way, you did see that it was repelled. That was quite clear. I had the current too high. I had the current too high, so we'll have it a little lower. And I will make the current come up very slowly. And then I want you to see that it levitates. There it is. Levitating. Oh, oh, off the screen. <laughs> there it is. And I can turn it over. And it's still levitating, of course. And the secret is this phase delay introduced by the self-inductance. Another ring here, which has a, a slot. Oh. An awful lot of choppiness. I don't know where that's coming from. Anyway, um... So, but you could see it sits at an angle, <laughs> you know, um, you know, which is a little bit, um, you know, needs sort of an explanation why it always angles. Why is it always angle? Um, and that is, is because the pressure is really pushing on one side. It's compressing because it can't go anywhere. So it's stuck more on one side than it is on the other side. So one side has more pressure stuck inside the conductor because it can't go anywhere. Also aluminum, same ring, but it has a slot. Well, 
So this gets back to the slot thing, right? So you just take two rings and you did the other experiment where he drops the ring into the magnetic field and the one with the slot just falls through and the one without the slot uh, doesn't. And his argument is, is because there's a current going through the ring and so you could argue that, well, if that was true, then you could just put a little tiny hairline wire across the gap and see if you could burn it up with the current. Is it's enough current to levitate, which means it's enough current, um, presumably, you know, to overcome gravity. Um, so it's got to be a pretty good little current going through there. So why wouldn't it just burn the wire? Or why can't you just measure it with a voltmeter? Or, <laughs> you know, and so there's no answers. You don't see any experiment explaining that. And then there's all these other experiments you could do. Well, if this is true that it fails, if it's broken, you know, it has a little gap in it, well, how much gap matters? If I make half a ring and another half a ring, uh, and I just tied them together with plastic, would those two levitate? Or if I made little quarter rings, you know, just plastic connecting them, would those little quarter pieces still levitate? Um, I think they would. And so this really doesn't have to do with the gap being um, anything other than a way... The, the irony is, is the gap is letting current move. <laughs> See, with the ring is closed, then the surface has no connection to the interior surface. So if it's closed, it has to go through the conductor, and the conductors only do this on the surface thing. They don't like going through this way. They'll go through this way, but they don't like current moving this way. So that's the catch with the conductor, is that the it's going to charge the outside surface first and most, and all the transferring is going to tend to want to go this you know through this way and not this way. So it, this surface can't communicate with this surface in a sense with the conductor, unless you break it and then it can go around this corner. So that's the key. The key is actually that when you break it, you allow the current to move. So it's exactly the opposite of how they theorize. Uh, I would argue the real facts are it's exactly the opposite. By breaking the, uh, the exterior surface, now you're allowing the exterior charge to be dissipated by the interior neutrality. So you're allowing it to... Um, the pressure to be uh, to escape. Well, the EMF in this ring is going to be identical. There's no difference. In fact, the self-inductance of this ring is identical. But the resistance of this ring is huge because there's a slot in there. The resistance is almost infinitely high. Right, which doesn't make any logical sense, right? Because it's only infinitely high between the gap. It's not infinitely high going this way, so if I put the two probes on the two edges, th this works just fine. So there's no infinitely high resistance, um, you know, logically. So they're completely dependent on some idea that this current has to go around inside the conductor. It has to go in some kind of circle, and that's not really the path. The, the idea is the current needs to get to the inside of the ring. <laughs> And so if the resistance is infinitely high, no matter what L is and what omega is, phi is going to be zero. Won't repel. Half the time it attracts, half the time it repels. That means nothing happens. No magnetic levitation. See? You can't store any pressure. So the other ring, the pressure is stuck. Can't go anywhere. You know, you're, st you're pushed you pushed and you pushed and you pushed and there's nowhere for that push to go because there's no there's no there's no place to get to any neutral atoms so there's no way to get rid of the pressure it's stuck once you've created it uh how else to say that um or the like i said you, the, this in this case the pressure is going on and off so you're depressurizing pressurizing depressurizing pressurizing but in either case they can't move anywhere so the pressure is stuck in the ring, in the location it was created, where the ring with the slot, the pressure is not stuck because the atoms now can communicate with the atoms on the inside of the ring. They have a path around the outside of the conductor. Same EMF, same self-inductance, but an infinite resistance, and here you see magnetic levitation. Since the induced current in the ring... 
So, I mean, again, they could demonstrate that this was the fact by, like I said, you could put a little wire across there or do something to indicate, you know, that, okay, we've completed the circuit. Uh, will it still work? And it still won't work because that little wire isn't fixing what you've broken. And what you've broken is you've created a path from the inside to the outside. So putting a wire across that gap won't save the experiment. The real issue, I, and like I said, they would do the experiment. When you're logically, you would say to yourself, yes, they would do it if, if it, that's the way it worked. They'd just put a tiny wire across there and say, see, now the current can get through that wire and everything's fine and it'll levitate. But it really won't because it doesn't undo the slot you made, which has really created the new pathway for the current. So um, I think I can logically demonstrate that their theory is incorrect in assuming that this is a problem of current having to jump the gap. And you'd also think they could make the slot so thin, you know, that they could uh, and, and even put a semiconductor in it or some other thing just to demonstrate, look, it has less power. But none of those things will fix the problem, which is you've created a, a surface for the, the current to travel. So yeah, I don't think I need to draw it, but so I'm just saying there's a clear distinction between what I'm arguing and what they're arguing, and I think it could be demonstrated by the fact that we don't see these experiments, because you'd think they would do them, because they would be very, look, see, it is a current. You see, we put a little wire there and it burned up, or we put a little wire there and it, now it floats, and we don't see that experiment done. It is extremely small because of its very high resistance. The force on the ring, whether it's repelling or attracting in any case, is practically zero. So that alone is enough reason for the ring not to move at all. All right, I hope to see all of you tomorrow during our exciting testing of the... Yeah, well, it doesn't move at all. It's because it's balanced. It's immediately responding by the speed of light, uh, you know, to the change in one field, this change in the other field. And uh, they find the medium, the happy medium or whatever you want to call it. All right, so that's uh, probably enough. And such. And so forth and whatnot. So, till the next time.